All right, so we've been taking a tour of the cell, uh, and we had just kind of got halfway through the endoplasm in particular. Um, we know a little bit about the anatomy, and there are two different types of endoplasmic reticulum. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which is where lipid synthesis in some forms of carbohydrate metabolism are going to occur. Uh, we also have toxin removal that occurs in the smooth ER. The other type of endoplasmic reticulum is the rough ER. And the rough endoplasmic reticulum is associated with ribosomes. And we now know that the ribosome is the protein synthesis organelle. So we're going to associate the rough ER with protein synthesis because of the presence of the ribosomes. And basically, the ribosome processes the information on the messenger RNA molecule, producing this, this chain of amino acids, polypeptide, that gets spit into the cisternal base <coughs> of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. In addition to making proteins, the rough endoplasmic reticulum <coughs> is also going to be the site of membrane production. So we have lipids that are being produced in the smooth ER that gets that get transferred over into the rough ER, and then as the proteins are being produced, some of these proteins are going to be membrane-bound proteins. All of these things get incorporated together. They get put into a nice little packet that then is going to get shipped from the rough to the plasma reticulum as a packet of membrane or kind of a ball of membrane, and it will be processed further by the Golgi complex before it gets popped into either the cell membrane or membranes of other organelles within the cell. For the smooth ER, the CH metabolism, Carbohydrate. You know, a lot of times what's happening with the carbohydrate metabolism is you have different carbohydrates that are being put together, and then those are set up to be attached to lipids and other proteins to form protein and glycolipids. The Golgi complex is going to be our next organelle. Endoplasmic reticulum here, and then the Golgi complex here. The Golgi complex um, looks somewhat similar to the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, a little bit different in appearance. Some people would describe it as being a stack of pancakes, or having the appearance of being a stack of pancakes. It's a two sided organelle. In the two sides, you have one side that faces the nucleus and one side that faces the cell membrane. The side that faces the nucleus is called the cis face. And it will be the side that receives transport vesicles. <laughs> so as the Endoplasmic reticulum produces proteins um, and, and membranes. They get everything packaged up into a vesicle, and that vesicle gets transported to this cis phase of the Golgi complex. The other phase, which faces out towards the membrane, is the trans phase. And this will be the side of the Golgi complex that sends out vesicles. Now, as the transport vesicles enter the cis space, they basically move from layer to layer, from pancake to pancake, through the Golgi complex. And then they're sent out by the trans space. And as they go through each of these layers, the molecules are going to be modified. And the two main molecules that are modified are the phospholipids and the 
proteins. So we take and modify these molecules a little bit further, get them ready for final form and final function in the cell or elsewhere. Uh, the Golgi complex is also responsible to produce other macromolecules. In fact, a lot of our different protein hormones are going to be produced in, um, in the Golgi complex. Um, which you said that um, with the two sided organelle, you said the, the cis phase connects the nucleus. Which way does it trans? It's out toward the, the, the cell membrane. Okay. And really, the cis and the trans phase, the cis phase is what. So when, when one of these vesicles comes out of the endoplasmic reticulum, it enters on the cis phase. And then those molecules that are contained within that transport vesicle move their way through each of these different layers, and the trans phase releases. And it just happens that most of the time the orientation is to have that cis phase towards the nucleus, that trans phase towards the cell membrane. All right, the next organelle I'd like you to be familiar with is <coughs> the lysosome. And the lysosome is basically the cell's recycling center. So this is where all the reusable junk that's no longer in use comes to get recycled and get reincorporated into the, the amino acid pool or the nucleic acid pool for future use in a new anatomical structure. Inside of, so the lysosome is a membrane-bound organelle, so we have that lipid bilayer, plasma membrane, and then inside we have uh, hydrolytic enzymes. What are hydrolytic enzymes, by the way, somebody? Yeah, it's an enzyme that uses the hydrolysis reaction, water to break <laughs> the bonds. So those hydrolytic enzymes are going to be involved in the digesting of worn out, no longer in use macromolecules. Now the other thing that's interesting here, and this is one of the benefits of putting um, functions into membrane-bound organelle, the normal pH of the cell is right around neutral, but these hydrolytic enzymes are going to function best at a pH of about 5. So we're going to actually work slightly better with our lysosome if we're closer to a pH of 5. That's basically 100 times more acidic than what the rest of the cell needs to live at. So in order to maintain that pH of 5, the lysosome is also going to have hydrogen pumps that pump hydrogen from the cytosol into the inside of the lysosome. So those hydrogen pumps continually bring hydrogen in, we increase hydrogen concentration, which decreases the acidic nature of the solution in the lysosome. So you can see in this figure here that you'll have things like the mitochondria or other parts of the cell that maybe are no longer functioning up to snuff. And so they'll get engulfed by the lysosome, and the lysosome attacks it with the acid and the uh, hydrolytic enzyme to break it down. It goes through sort of a digestion process, and it's going to be delivered out back into, um, into a packet that can then be used uh, by the Golgi complex in the rest of the yard to regenerate you know, the, the, maybe a new mitochondria, or it might be a different uh, you know, patch of membrane or something. So we're just continually recycling the cellular material through the lysosome.
The cell also will exhibit vacuoles and vesicles. And these have already been mentioned. I use the term transport vesicle. That's a specific type of vesicle. And basically, the vacuole or the vesicle, it's a membrane-bound sac that have various functions. And we differentiate the function by adding on things like transport vesicles. So this is going to be used to move materials around the cell and to move materials across the cell membrane. Uh, another example is the food vacuole. And the food vacuole is um, the result of phagocytized nutrients. Inside of the cells of protists, these are single cell eukaryotic organisms. And a lot of them will find in uh, uh, aqueous and spondylates and, and things like that. Some of them can become pathogenic <coughs> in your own body fluid. But they contain a contractile vacuole. that they use for movement. And they basically fill it up with water and they can pump that water. And by pumping the water, they can use it as a propellant. Uh, in plants, they have a large central vacuum. <clears throat> And that vacuole wrapped up in a membrane that we call the tonoplast membrane. And the plant, the central vacuole has really two functions. One is just to be a storage site and will store macro molecules <coughs> and toxins. And the other is to, is to help to deal with um, the tonicity that the plant cells can be exposed to. As you know, tonicity is what drives water into or away from the inside of the cell. And it can cause the cell to swell or to shrink. Well, plants are exposed to various degrees of water environments. And by having the central vacuole, they actually can help to control the effects of the tonicity on the cell. And we'll actually get in more detail on that um, when we start to talk a little bit about um, a little bit about plants. The next organelle I want to bring up is called the mitochondria. Uh, and I also want to introduce you to uh, at the same time a plant-specific organelle called the chloroplast. And the reason that I'm bringing these two things up together is because they collectively make up the energy production organelle within eukaryotic organisms and cells. So chloroplast, again, this is going to be primarily plant-specific. Mitochondria also are found in plants, but they're found in mammals like humans as well. These are our main energy producers. The mitochondria produces energy through respiration, and the chloroplast produces energy through photosynthesis. Now both the mitochondria and the chloroplast, you can see here they have an inner and an outer membrane. The inner 
in outer membranes are going to become really important in the process. We're going to talk about those inner and outer membranes when we start to talk about <coughs> metabolism and energy, energy production. The other thing that's pretty interesting here is both have their own DNA and their own ribosomes. And from the DNA and the ribosomes contained within the mitochondria and within the chloroplast, <clears throat> both can make some proteins on their own. Now, the thing that's interesting is you would think, oh, it's probably just mitochondrial protein, it's probably just chloroplast protein. But what we actually are finding out is that from the chloroplast and the mitochondrial genomes, they're actually generating proteins that end up in the cell functioning elsewhere. So not just specifically to the mitochondria or to the chloroplast. There are some various shapes and sizes to, in particular, the mitochondria, but also the um, chloroplast as well. But the mitochondria, um, how many of you have heard the term endosymbiotic relationship? One of you? Two of you? Really? The endosymbiotic relationship. So endosymbiotic relationship, this is the idea that at one time in evolutionary history, a small bacterial shaped mitochondria uh, cell innervated another nucleus containing cell. And it wasn't digested, it wasn't destroyed as an invader, but it took up residence and began to produce energy that that cell began to use. And so the evolutionists would say that, look at the mitochondria, it has its own DNA, and it has a bacterial shape. So at one time, it was its own living organism that invaded another cell, and now it has incorporated into that cell, proven another point of evolution. Um, unfortunately, for the naturalists, it's not really panning out too well anymore. Because what we know is there's lateral, lateral gene transfer between this one organism and the other organism, it doesn't happen, right? I can't transfer any of my genes over, over to Devante. You can't transfer any of mine. You can't do lateral gene transfer. If I eat a cow, well, I'm not eating a cow. If I eat a hamburger that was from a cow, I'm eating this genetic material. I'm eating a cow's DNA, right? I'm not going to get <coughs> I'm not going to have that. I'm going to digest and destroy that material. I'm going to extract out the individual nucleotides and individual amino acids. So we don't have any examples of lateral gene transfer that's occurring between two separate organisms. But we have examples of lateral gene transfer that's occurring between the mitochondria and the rest of the cell. In addition, they said it's bacterial shaped. And so it looks like a bacteria. It must have been a bacteria at one time. Well, admittedly, there are mitochondria that are, in fact, bacterial shaped. However, what we're beginning to realize is that there's also mitochondria that have a spiral shape, especially the mitochondria that are associated with the flagella of the um, mammalian sperm cell. There's also examples of mitochondria that have a reticular shape. So they look more like the endoplasmic reticulum in the Golgi complex. Uh, one of the big places that we see this is in the skeletal muscle of mammals. And the skeletal muscle is so packed full of proteins that we put in the mitochondria and we basically fit it in wherever we can and it's all connected into one reticulum. When you take a cross section through that particular cell, the individual kind of columns of this reticulum look very bacterial in shape. So you might take a single section through a muscle cell and you might see mitochondria that have this bacterial shape. But now what we've done is we've actually taken serial sections where we'll take a cell 
and we'll cut multiple times through it, image all of those as, as two-dimensional images, use computer algorithms and programs to put it together into a three-dimensional model. And then as we do that, what we begin to see is that you can have these long columns that are interconnected into a reticular shape and it no longer holds that bacterial shape. So it's probably a reticulum in a lot of cases uh, rather than just simply being a bacteria. Looks very similar to a vacuole or a, a vesicle, but it's <coughs> its own separate, um, its own separate organelle. It's called a peroxisome, and the function of the peroxisome again, lipid bilayer, and then inside it's loaded up with an enzyme. And that enzyme that's present is going to take molecule that contains hydrogen and it's going to donate oxygen to form hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. So this oxygen, it can come over here and, so to speak, attack the hydrogen and disrupt that bond. If that's DNA or something like that, that's going to cause a real problem. It's going to cause the DNA molecule to mutations. So we want to protect that. So we have the ability to take that oxygen and rather than having it attack nucleic acids or proteins, it can attack water to form hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is still injurious, and we don't want to leave the hydrogen peroxide around. So we'll take those reactive oxygen species, which are basically an oxygen that's out searching for a binding partner. It has an extra electron that's on bond. We want to bind that electron. Call that a reactive oxygen species. It is a natural biochemical byproduct of metabolism. So those reactive oxygen species can be picked up and converted into H2O2. So there's a bunch of enzymes. One of the big ones that we would find in the peroxisome is an enzyme called catalase. Another one is superoxide disputants. They take a reactive oxygen species, chemically react it with water to form H2O2, which is still a toxin, but it does not have the same reactive uh, characteristics as the reactive oxygen species or my oxygen searching for another binding partner. But we take that toxin, the H2O2, and it can be further broken down. And if we use two hydrogen peroxide molecules, we can convert those two hydrogen peroxide molecules in the presence of an enzyme like catalase into water and a fully formed oxygen molecule. It's no longer a reactive oxygen species. <laughs> and it helps to protect the rest of the cell from those reactive oxygen species. It gives us the ability to handle the production of those reaction, reactive oxygen species. The next organelle isn't really a membrane bound organelle, it's called the cytoskeleton. It really is a network of proteinaceous fibers. And they work their way all the way through the cell, and it literally means the cell's skeleton, cytoskeleton. And it helps to support the cell and maintain its structure. So this network of proteinaceous fibers that all work together to provide support to the cell. It also, uh, we're going to find cytoskeletal proteins supporting the structure of the nucleus. In addition to the support 
capabilities of the um, cytoskeleton. We now have a bunch of filaments running throughout. We have this basically network. And we can use it as a transport network, a physical transport infrastructure, where those cytoskeletal proteins act as a conduit for other organelle to move around the cell. There are three filament types that we can identify in eukaryotic cells. And those three filament types are basically going to be differentiated based off of their size. Microtubes are about 25 nanometers in thickness and are the biggest or thickest of these filaments. The next are going to be the acting filaments or what are more properly called microfilaments. So we have our microfilaments or our acting filaments. And then right in the middle, right around 10 nanometers in diameter, we just simply have what we'll call an intermediate. Intermediate So take all of these different organelles in different concentrations and different numbers and wrap them up in a plastic uh, membrane called a cell membrane. Add in some cytosol, basically a solution of water containing electrolytes, and you have an individual cell. For some organisms, that's all they need is just that one cell, and they can do everything that they need to do to live. For many organisms, they are multicellular, and so you have to take individual cells and begin to put them together. Uh, so I really briefly want to talk about cell-cell interactions. In terms of cell biology, the individual cell is what's defined as being the smallest unit of life. On its own, the mitochondria is not a living system. The mitochondria incorporated into another, uh, incorporated into a cell with other organelle will then become part of the living system. And so the cell is our smallest unit of life. If it's not a cell, it's not a unit of life. It's not so a virus. I don't think you can define a virus as being a living organism. I think it's something else because they do not have cells. And again, some individual organisms, the individual cell is all they need. Other organisms are multicellular, and so you have to begin to group cells together. When you group cells together, you gain additional function. So you might have a cell that's really good at producing electrical signals. And so you might have a neuron that we find in our central nervous system. And then you add in some cells that are really good at protecting other cells from foreign invaders and debris and things like that. Uh, when they're incorporated together, you get a tissue called nervous tissue that's protected by neural glia and is functional in the neuron producing electrical signals. So taking cells together, we get more function. Uh, and you should remember that the hierarchy here of function is going to be from the cells 
we incorporate a bunch of cells together to form a tissue. And usually we say that it's similar acne cells incorporated into an extracellular based matrix is a tissue. And then I take several different types of tissue and I begin to put them together into a functional organ, several different organs, put them together to the organ system. And each step along the way, we gain additional properties or properties of merge as we increase in complexity. So now we just we don't have muscles that just can contract, or I'm sorry, tissues that can just contract. We have tissues that can contract that interact with tissue from the nervous system to help that tissue contract, add some fat in, adipose tissue, and we end up with the heart. All right, so putting two cells together, these are two individual cells, they're going to make contact. And we want that contact to be more than just a neighboring cell. We want it to actually be uh, adhered. <coughs> so there's a couple ways we adhere the cells together. We call those cell contacts. I'm going to start with plants. Plants make a form of a contact that's called a plasmodesmata. And what you can see is we actually are going to have these contacts that allow a mixing of the cytosol sol between individual plant cells. There's going to be proteins in here around this pore that help adhere the two cells together and hold the two cells together. Okay, so kind of blow things up here. We'll have a pore that forms, and then in that pore that forms, you're going to have a bunch of proteins that kind of span between the two areas, the two cells, to hold those cells in close contact. And so these are going to show up all over. You're going to have many of these in uh, multiple different cells holding that plant tissue together. In animals, we have three types of cell contacts. The first is called a tight junction. And the tight junction are proteins that lock the space between adjacent cells. So there are proteins that basically seclude the spacing between cells. These are the two membranes of the cells. This is space in between. It's a tight junction, so there's not much mixing with the surrounding tissue. It's kind of all encased. And then these proteins span, again, those two membranes to adhere stuff together. The second is the desmosome. And the desmosomes bind two cells together. And they're typically going to be attached into or anchored into our cytoskeletal filaments called the intermediate filaments. <coughs> our very last cell is very similar to the plasma desmata. We have basically a proteaceous structure that creates a pore between two in, uh, adjacent cells uh, through the membrane. The N word. It, it's intermediate. I think 
not having to be just word up there. So the gap junction is going to be this port between two cells that allows the cytosol to be shared. And the advantage of this is because the cytosol is shared, the water and the particles, small particles, between the two cells readily and quickly mix. And so any electrolyte changes that happen in one cell is going to be immediately translated into the other cell. In the heart of mammals, the muscle cells of the heart are attached together at what's called an intercalated disc or intercalated disc. And there are a bunch of gap junctions there. And when we change sodium concentration and calcium concentration, <coughs> potassium concentration, in the cells of the heart, we cause the heart cells to begin to contract. And we want them to contract basically all together in a syncytium for the top part of the heart and all in a syncytium on the bottom part of the heart. So we have all these gap junctions. So as soon as there's that change in the uh, concentration of sodium in one cell, it's immediately permeated to all the other cells in the heart. We <coughs> muscle contraction of the heart. Everybody got all of this. Time to go to another new lecture. We want to call it something, call it membranes. So I now want to kind of hone in on the membrane. And this isn't necessarily just the cell membrane. It's any biological membrane. So it could be the cell membrane, or it could be the membranes around the mitochondria or the chloroplasts, or around the Golgi complex, or around lysosomes and peroxisomes. We're going to just generally talk about biological membranes. But it will be easiest if we sort of highlight the plasma membrane around the cell, what we would call the cell membrane, and look at its function, and then its function can be applied to other biological membranes that we might find in the cell. All right, so the definition of a biological membrane, one, it's going to be selectively permeable. And we've already kind of defined what that means, so I'll give you a real quick definition of selectively permeable. Hold on. Yeah, it's only going to allow what it needs into the cell when it needs it. So it's selecting exactly what is required. If it needs sodium, sodium is a lot of glucose. <coughs> glucose, glucose is a lot of glucose. Do you have a question, David? So it's selectively permeable. Permeable just means that things can cross. Selectively means it's choosing exactly what's going to cross at a specific time. It's a bilayer. Bilayer, you remember, means that there are two distinct defined layers. And this is all centered around um, phospholipid physiology, where we have a hydrophilic head that faces a watery environment and the hydrophobic tails that face each other. So protect, to keep the tails protected from that watery environment. This becomes a barrier that has an inside and an outside boundary. The inside boundary is what abuts to the intracellular fluid. The outside boundary abuts to the extracellular fluid. 
It's a bilayer that's selectively permeable and it is comprised of lipids. But it's not just simply comprised of lipids. Many of the lipids are going to be specifically phospholipids, but we see other lipids as well, right? We see cholesterol. Um, some membranes, like in the brain, will have some other functional groups added onto that phosphate uh, uh, group to make it even a little bit different function. In addition to the lipids, the phospholipids and the cholesterol, we also are going to have proteins. These lipids and proteins can further be modified to contain carbohydrates. So within a membrane, we might have here in yellow some cholesterol, here in uh, pink with the tails is just a phospholipid. We may have individual proteins, or we may have carbohydrates that are attached, making it a glycoprotein or uh, some carbohydrates that are attached directly to the, um, the membrane itself, making them glycolipids. So really, there is a ton of stuff that's going on inside of the membrane. Proteins and carbohydrates and different types of lipids, all associated in this boundary, wrapping up the cell and wrapping up the individual organelle within the cell. All right, what does the term model mean? Does anyone remember? <coughs> the model is just simply the way that humans try to organize the complexities of different systems, in this particular case, a biological membrane system, so that we can understand what's going on. So the model that we turn to to try to understand membrane biology is called the fluid mosaic model. And each of these parts or components mean something specific. And I'm going to start out um, first with just general con conversation on the phospholipids. I'm starting here because the, these are going to be, by and large, the highest concentration, most common lipids that are present in the cell membrane. And so really, the phospholipids and their function, everything else is sort of put into the phospholipids to define this model that's called the fluid mosaic model. And I'm eventually going to get down to tell you what the fluid means and what the mosaic means means, because each of those individual parts has some very specific definitions. Uh, but the phospholipid, we already are familiar that phospholipids have a hydrophobic set of tails and a hydrophilic head. So hydrophobic, even near, right? Hydrophobic. Hydrophobic tails and hydrophilic heads. Hydrophobic means it's water fearing. It's going to avoid interacting with water at all costs. Hydrophilic means that it really likes to interact with water. So the head will face the water. Now the phospholipids, if I put them into a watery environment, they're going to organize themselves in such a way that they're going to have the barrier between the two different compartments uh, exposed only to the hydrophobic heads. This characteristic, hydrophilic heads rather, this characteristic where we have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions of the molecule means that the molecule is considered amphipathic. Amphipathic, just kind of like ambidextrous, it has this two-sided nature between hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Okay, so the phospholipids that we're basically putting everything else into, all of the proteins and the different types of lipids that are not phospholipids, and the uh, carbohydrate moieties to make up glycoproteins and glycolipids. So let's start out with the fluid part of this model. 
the fluid part of this model. Basically, the fluid part, just like if I were to come in here and dump water onto the table, the water would flow. And you would say that fluid flows. The phospholipid, with their embedded proteins, they move like a fluid. So they are not static. In other words, if I was a protein embedded in a membrane, I'm going to spend my life just sort of moving around that membrane, kind of sliding through or swinging through those phospholipids. How easily those phospholipids and those proteins move is going to be defined on the characteristics of the membrane. And we're going to have times when the characteristics change. The membrane temperature can change. And when the temperature changes, it increases and decreases the fluidity. If we have a decrease in temperature, we take heat away. This causes the lipids of the proteins to move less. As they move less, they become more and more like a solid. So that would be a decrease in the ability to move. So we have decreased movement. In other words, another way that we could say this is that the membranes with that decrease in temperature begin to solidify. Now, they don't ever become totally solid, like what we may see with butter or something like that. They kind of spend their life in <coughs> the oil really loose in butter. They're kind of in between there someplace, but I think in terms of their consistency. So if we freeze a membrane and remove a bunch of temperature from that membrane, it would solidify and it would become more uh, fat like, or more on um, that fat, but larger butter like. That's not a good thing. We actually want to have, just like everything else in biology, we have a homeostatic level of fluidness that we need to maintain in the cell. And that fluidness is going to be protected by a couple different mechanisms. And we've already actually hit on a couple of these mechanisms. What's the difference between a oil at room temperature and a material that's a solid at room temperature. Does anyone remember? What do we do to the fatty acids? So in terms of like cooking oil that's liquid at room temperature versus lard that's solid at room temperature, what is the difference between their fatty acids? Basically the tails of the molecule. Okay, it could be how fast the molecules are moving. What allows oil molecules to move quicker than at the same temperature than the water molecules? How long do they take? And what do you mean by arrangement? The difference in saturated and unsaturated. Yes. So if we can unsaturate the fatty acid tails. This means that we're going to induce a kink in that tail. And now that fatty acid holds the other fatty acids further apart, so there's more room for it to move. If it has more room to move, it becomes more fluid. So we put a kink in the chain. That separation means that that solidification process is going to occur at even lower temperatures. So now I can remove a little bit more temperature <coughs> from the biological system before I begin to solidify the membrane. I think I've already used the example of caribou. Have we talked about caribou before in this class? Anyone know what a caribou is? It's like a big name. Okay, yeah, it's actually a deer species. Um, lives, typically lives most of its life up on the tundra, uh, which is a very, most of its time, 
very cold place. In the summer, it's pretty warm, though, and it can even get into the 70s and 80s during the summer. And so they go through this massive change in a one-year, 365-day time period where temperatures are high to where temperatures are really, really low. I'm telling you, if you change temperature, you're going to begin to solidify the membrane. You reduce its fluidness. If we reduce its fluidness, the membrane begins to lose its function. If we lose function, the cell's not going to work as well. And it goes, poor Kirabu, every time the temperature drops, they would end up dying because their cells would start to solidify. The membranes would start to solidify. They alter the kinks in their fatty acid chains. They produce more phospholipids during the winter time with bigger kinks. So they unsaturate their lipids and pop those into the membranes. And they also use cholesterol. They change the amount of cholesterol that's embedded, embedded in the membrane. And we're going to pick up with cholesterol and membranes on Friday.